This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. The clock is ticking down until the midterms. We're about four months away from the big day in November and historically, midterm elections after a presidential election tend to go poorly for the president's party, especially since Joe Biden currently carries one of the lowest approval ratings of a president going into midterms. With Democrats already operating with only a nine seat majority in the House and an even 50-50 split in the Senate, the stakes are sky high for either party here. Every seat is going to count. On this vote, the yeas are 50, the nays are 50, the Senate being equally divided, the vice president votes in the affirmative, and the concurrent resolution as amended is adopted. That tight race for power in Congress is also why so many observers and political strategists are becoming increasingly worried about the role of election misinformation. False election fraud claims or misinformation around voting can have a massive toll on the whole cycle, and the wave of misinformation has already begun. Newsy correspondent Tyler Adkison tells us more about what we're already seeing and what's in store for the upcoming elections. With just about four months until the 2022 midterm elections, misinformation experts, civil rights advocates, and researchers are worried that social media companies are unprepared to deal with the potential onslaught of falsehoods about the election. We saw a slew of policies put in place before and during the 2020 presidential election, but those policies haven't cut down all of the misinformation, and in some cases have been revoked. Midterm elections are harder than presidential elections for these platforms just because of what she said, 435 congressional seats, 30 some odd Senate races, I think it's some 30 odd gubernatorial races, state legislatures, others. It is much more, again, decentralized, um, which makes it both harder to know where to, to tackle, but also harder to keep track of. For instance, more than 100 Republican primary winners in statewide or congressional races have backed the false claim that the 2020 election was rigged, with many doing so online, according to the Washington Post. Additionally, the New York Times found that the film 2000 Mules, which falsely claims the election was stolen from former President Donald Trump, had more than 430,000 interactions on Facebook and Instagram by June. What's more, these online narratives are bleeding into the real world. An NPR investigation found that since the January 6th insurrection, four prominent election denialists have held more than 308 events, often small and at the grassroots level, across 45 states and the District of Columbia. As long as we're talking about U.S.-based tech companies that are running on algorithmic amplification of whatever is most viral and trending, um... This is a systemic issue that will never like never be fought because it's always in the interest of platforms to amplify at least to a certain extent and to intervene a little too late because you still want the spread, right? And you still want um, engagement metrics to rise. Josip Vitacho helped author a letter for more than 120 civil society groups to seven major social media companies, noting that, quote, disinformation related to the 2020 election has not gone away but has continued to proliferate. The letter's demands included consistent enforcement of civic integrity policies during both election and non-election cycles, and prioritizing enforcement around combating what they call the big lie that says Trump won the 2020 election. A lot of the disinformation that we're seeing now is really recycled content from the big lie, but it's packaged in, in new ways that is getting more and more attention. So when we're talking about the 2022 election cycle, we're seeing a lot of candidates now preemptively declare voter fraud. Uh, and this is based primarily off the big lie. Uh, actually, a lot of candidates are using the big lie as a platform plank. Another challenge to moderating 2022 midterm misinformation is the rising popularity of video content on social media. According to a Pew Research poll, as of mid-2021, more than 80% of Americans say they use YouTube. And TikTok is now the most popular website in the world. There are three main challenges. The first um, is that live video is incredibly difficult to moderate because it's live. The second, as I mentioned, is just the complexity of video data relative to text data. You know, the ability to classify these data at scale are relatively underdeveloped um, compared to, to sort of text data. And the third um, is that, you know, 
external researchers, journalists, civil society groups. We don't have the, the sort of resources or capacity to deal with video data right now. And so I think what we've seen is it's taken sort of an all of society effort to hold social media companies responsible. Um, in, in sort of text form when we saw text as the main way that information spread. For former Facebook employees like Harbath, the situation is too little too late. What's important, however, is to start thinking about the next set of elections. We should have started thinking about the 2024 election a couple of months ago, in all honesty, um, and, be, and be thinking about that through the lens of the midterms and how you keep that thorough point um, continuing. Because we know that the 2024 election is going to start maybe even before the midterms start, but immediately afterwards. Tyler Adkison, Newsy, Chicago. All right, thanks so much for that, Tyler. So far, we've been looking at misinformation in English only, and many platform tools tend to focus on English words, phrases, and sources. And that's a particular concern within major voting blocks in the US. Some research has indicated that online platform tools might not be as effective at combating misinformation in other languages. That includes Spanish, which about 13% of the US population speaks at home. In the 2020 presidential election, the Latino voting bloc was the second largest bloc for the first time. One in 10 voters were Latino, and 53.7% of eligible voters turned out in the polls. But now with the internet becoming as big a source for news as TV among US Latinos, many are wondering what role online misinformation is going to play in the upcoming 2022 midterms. One political strategist, Evelyn Perez Verdia, has been sounding this alarm for a while. Evelyn is the founder and CEO of We Are Mas, a political strategy organization working with connecting candidates to Latino communities across the United States. Evelyn, thank you so, so much for joining us. Uh, to start off, can you tell us a bit about when you started to bring attention to this issue about misinformation? I mean, what were you seeing online? What kind of stories were getting shared? Well, thank you, Christian, and thank you for covering this important issue. One of the first times I saw this, the first time was actually in a WhatsApp channel in Spanish of a Colombian leader, a uh, Colombian American leader in Florida that was using the chat to spread um, uh, malinformation in reference to the um, gub gubernatorial candidates here in the state of Florida. Um, it said practically, let me show you the difference between Andrew Gillum, which uh, the, the socialist, and Ron DeSantis, the capitalist. And once we started seeing that, we started seeing stronger and stronger um, attacks um, to different leaders, uh, make connecting them to communism and socialism, which they were not. And um, it started getting stronger every year. Many people who say, look, you know, you're, you know, you're trying to censor us. No, we're not trying to censor anyone. We just want our communities to receive the facts. And, and what we're seeing right now is a very, very strong attack um, to the LGBTQ community, um, the transgender community. Um, a great example was the mass shooting in Ovalde, te te Texas, where in WhatsApp Spanish language channels, they were spreading um, disinformation saying that the shooter was transgender and that the shooter was undocumented when neither was true. And creating that sense of, you know, of division and hate toward other communities that are part of this nation. Yeah. Tell me um, a, a bit more about what platforms or apps are most responsible for, for spreading a lot of this. Where are you seeing um, you know, the majority of misinformation that was being disseminated at the time? So first of all, we have to understand that it's borderless. Now, there are certain areas that seem to be targeted specifically because there are certain communities that are there to if you if you have friends in another country you have whatsapp you know it's even if you're not latino my family's from colombia and i talk to my cousins in bogota and i and i enjoy that but then you also know that there's another side to it um telegram telegram um just in telegram we have found around sixty-six thousand subscribers to QAnon channels specific to culture we have QAnon colombia QAnon venezuela QAnon peru um, very specific, more open channels of different communities. Um, and when you get into those QAnon channels of Colombia, they try to connect culturally specific issues 
that matter to a specific culture. So uh, I think that when we look at this, we really need to go in depth and not look at it as a macro, but look at it also in a micro engagement issue in terms of how we engage with our communities and give them accurate information based on cultures and subcultures. What is it you wish people understood about Spanish language misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, and how to better combat it? We have to understand that they see the politics of our country based and the, through the prism of the politics of their nation. So we have to make sure that we engage with them in a way that they understand, with words they understand, that unite us versus divide us. So I think the number one thing that we need to make sure is to see, one, research how, how, how in depth have communities been affected, Latino communities um, been affected, and in depth in terms of Colombian, Venezuelan, Argentina, and all the different communities we have, and not put us in a whole, in a bowl, but realize that we're all different. Um, and also uh, start creating messaging that informs them in an accurate manner, um, depending on, on what we want to share with them. Evelyn Perez Verdia is the founder and CEO of We Are Mas, a political strategy organization working with connecting candidates to Latino communities across the United States. Evelyn, thank you so much for your time and for your expertise.